<clears throat> I'm transitioning from my central nervous system stimulant. <laughs> Jen's going to flex her skills in mixology and create some central nervous system depressants um, <laughs> that we're then going to consume and have a great conversation. And then um, we are definitely going to open it up to ask Jen anything or ask me anything. We'll go to an AMA style format after we talk for a little bit. So we've got microphone here. Um, please ask a question. This is not a statement in the form of a question. It's a question. And then we'll discuss the question. So. Um, just please use this microphone if you can. It's harder to see if there's another one. Great. So that's what we're going to do. That's the plan. Thanks for coming. Um, Jen's a, a multiple time DEF CON uh, veteran and, uh, and is fascinating. I always um, loving, loves. It. So, disclaimer um, I'm, uh, Jen's my director. I'm on the advisory council she set up at CISA. So normally when I interact with Jen, it's much form, more formal. We're delivering reports, technical advisory uh, recommendations to her. Her staff, CISA, determines whether to accept our recommendations, reject them, modify them. And so outside of that dynamic, it's fantastic for her to make a drink for me. <laughs> so thank you. Good for you. <laughs> Do you want me to? Yeah. That, why don't you tell us what you're doing? Oh. All right. I will. Yeah. What's what's going on here? So, hey, everybody. I'm, my name is Jen. Uh, so this is the, it should have been the fourth time, but that 2021 was a COVID year. Uh, this is my third time at DEF CON, and this is my favorite uh, con of the year, my favorite thing to do. I look forward to it every single year. Um, and last year... I was not, it was my second time, but I was with two newbies. And so they had to do shots. So I, you know, in solidarity. But I said this year, like, Jeff, what do you want to do? And, and he's like, well, I don't know. What do you want to do? And I said, well, let's just, uh, let's just have some cocktails and cyber talk and, and uh, hear, from, yeah, see hear where, from my friends. See where it goes. Yeah. So um, before I took this job, I chatted with Jeff and... I said, hey, Jeff, what's your, what's your best advice to be successful as the director of CISA? And it was great advice. It wasn't like shockingly, you know, um, uh, surprising advice, but it has really stayed with me since I took this job. And it was like, be a part of the community, you know, really like be a part of the community because it's an amazing community. And you know, CISA is not an intel agency. We're not a law enforcement agency. We're not a regulator. Everything we do is by, with, and through partners. And our success is predicated on our ability to catalyze trusted partnerships, whether it's with industry, with the research community, with the hacker community, across the federal government, with the state and local community, with election officials. It's all about how do you build trusted partnerships. And people don't trust institutions. They trust people. And so I like to get out and spend time with all of our partners so that they understand who I am, who my team is, what we do, the value that we bring, and how we can help support others and serve others and ultimately help the American people. So I'm excited. Um, we're going to chat a little bit, but we really did just want to open this up as, a, as an ask, ask us anything, AUA, I guess. Yeah, AUA. Um, you can ask all the hard questions to Jeff. Uh, and I'll take all the I'll take all the easy ones. But I do want to thank my friend Jeff, um, who has been a fabulous partner um, throughout my three plus years in this job, uh, and for your service as well as the head of our technical advisory council and really important work uh, throughout the last three years. So super grateful for that. Well, you're uh, you're one of the first people that actually listened to my advice <laughs> um, and and really actually visibly did some of the hard work to actually engage. Um, building community is not easy and it sometimes fails. And um, so I, I, I appreciate you calling that out because, you know, CIS has got some interesting things. You can convene people. Um, you can try to regulate people. 
you nope. can nope well in some critical infrastructure areas you yeah. could f you know not chemical well no we, we lost those authorities unfortunately we lost the authorities yeah we're gonna have to drink to that um and so uh so there's essentially you know the areas where you can be a convener uh or you can be a coordinator right a lot of sector coordination um and so knowing what hat you're wearing and when and which is appropriate um and i really love that you used that phrase people trust individuals not institutions that was the one of the first lessons i learned at ICANN um when i was back there was that nobody is going to everything's built on individual trust they're not going to reveal the secret to the random organization they're going to reveal it to their friend that they trust in the organization which then means you have to have people that are willing to put in the time to travel and not turn over every year and so my, one of my pieces of advice was Jen is like find some non-political appointees people will be there for a long time some full-time employees and they will be your like avatars out in the community that people can build trust with and make sure you're committing enough budget that they can show up in enough places over time that those relationships build and you have a, a way of mentoring the next. And she did it, which is awesome. Okay, we're not doing an orange. What, the orange one? Not the orange ones. Oh, uh, right. okay. We start out and made a bit of a mess okay, there. Okay, so tell us what you've done here. Okay, we had a little bitters. We had a little sugar cube that's partially melted. We have a little maker's mark. Didn't have a lot of success with the orange. But I do have some maraschino cherries. What is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's my favorite. So I don't see the cherry in here. I didn't. Okay. All right. All right. What's? I, I want the full meal deal. Like, all right. All right. Like if it's on the table. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. As long as you're having one, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. We have to have a parity, you know, a public-private partnership here. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. There you go, brother. Excellent. Thank you. I don't want to know how many government regulations we're violating None. Uh, uh, right now. We had all of this approved. <laughs> you had it all approved by the OGE lawyer, yes. Okay, so um, while you're mixing, yeah. um, maybe you can be thinking about like, over the last three years now that you've been building this community, maybe tell us what you think of when you, when you, when you see a community like DEF CON and we want to get engaged, People want to help. They don't know how to help. They're not very many good on-ramps to helping. And they don't even know if they have the right skills that are needed. And then on the other hand, you've got government doing the same thing. They see this pool of talented people, but they don't necessarily know how to approach them. They don't know what to ask of them. How have you, how have you puzzled through that? Or, or is it like an ongoing like mix and match, or I'll use your term, uh, Rubik's Cube solve, right? Yeah. Trying to get everything on the right, right color on the right side. Yeah. So we have tried really, really hard um, to be an agency that is not a lumbering government bureaucracy, right? Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I mean, again, like I was in the government for 27 years. I was in the army for most of that time. I was the National Security Agency. I was in the White House a couple times doing policy, and then I left to go to the private sector. I was at Morgan Stanley for four and a half years, and it was like a very liberating feel, frankly, to leave the federal government and go to the private sector. And I, when I looked back from uh, the private sector to the federal government, I'm like, oh, Whoa, uh, that's really hard to understand. Like a reverse culture shock? Yeah, it was. It really was. And when I came back, I was very determined to ensure that this agency, which was then the newest agency in the federal government, um, that we were going to add value, not friction, um, that we were going to be accessible, uh, that we were going to be transparent, that we were going to be responsive, and it sounds like obvious, but it's not that, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing. And so we really just wanted to build a very different culture from your typical government agency. And a lot of that is being accessible to the community. So that's sort of the, the first thing, because, you, you know, if you only show up once a year, if you only, you know, I mean, people know you're not authentic about it. And so you have to be part of the community. And, and when you're part of the community, you're going to take some lumps. Yeah, well, 
Dude, I've taken a lot of lumps in my life, so that's not that's not a problem for me. Um, but you know, I do treat feedback as a gift. I really do. Like, I don't really, I don't really appreciate people who are assholes. Um, I get it, you know. But if, but I really appreciate Frank, you know, positive critical feedback. That's like given like constructive people constructive it, it, feedback given in yeah. good faith. Yeah, good faith feedback is always. Yeah, I mean, I you know, if you want to be a dick, that's fine. But like, I don't really have time for you. Right. Right. And so if it as long as it's coming from a good place, half the questions, they just don't know it's already been answered. Yeah. So it's just a lot of t trying to orient people. Totally. So then, um, so maybe in the last, since you first started showing up at DEF CON, have there been good examples or any exchanges of things that worked out the way you thought or didn't work out? Like, it's enough time to... Yeah, I mean, I will tell you, it's funny, the first experience I had with DEF CON, I wasn't actually here. It was it was when I was working at the National Security Agency in 2013. Oh, do tell. Remember? <laughs> um, and it was, I was working counterterrorism, and it was the year of Snowden. And my boss at the time, Keith Alexander, wanted to come to Vegas. I think you probably chatted with him about that. Um, and I didn't come with them then, but I was one of the staffers who sort of helped um, help prepare remarks for that. And I think the, you know, I think the vibe is very, very different from those days, right? The whatever the I hate I hate the term Fed. I just have to say that, but it's like the federal is. Um, but I, I, I think it's come a long way. And I mean, people have been so gracious, so kind. So I mean, it's been fantastic. That's why I love this community because everybody here, um, I think, shares the desire to actually do good. Um, to fix things, uh, to help. Right. Um, and that's what we need because, frankly, our job is to protect and defend the critical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of every day. And the vast majority of that infrastructure is owned and operated by other people. And so if we do not catalyze a community approach to driving down risk to our technology ecosystem, we won't be successful. Right. Yeah, do you think that's maybe... Um an advantage in the in the US model I mean not every country has so much critical infrastructure owned and operated by a private entity um, and so maybe it's a secret benefit I hadn't even really considered um, because as long as you can orient the owner operators to do the right thing they're not just waiting in a passive mode for top-down command and control telling them to patch this or do that right there's enough independent autonomy or maybe diversity well, there's definitely um, diversity, and you could say diversity equals resilience. But I, I gave a talk yesterday at Black Hat, and you know, since I've been in this job now three plus years, we're trying to figure out. You know, when I came in, ransomware is a problem. Three plus years later, ransomware is still a big problem. <laughs> you, you know, I think the really important progress that we have made with the community, I think. Um, we have been able to catalyze real collaboration between the federal government, state and local, industry, hacker community, um, academia, I mean, all kinds of partners. We, we've been able to build good collaboration. Um, second, I think CEOs and boards and business leaders are increasingly uh, seeing cyber risk as a core business risk. I think that's really good. I think there is greater awareness of the importance of basic cyber hygiene. You know, we have this Secure Our World campaign, the four things to do. And so, you know, we've been working on that. Um, I love uh, I love efforts like Craig Newmark's Cyber Civil Defense, really bringing together the community and we, we help with some of the cyber clinics. I think that's really great. But I think at the end of the day, unless we stop talking about the villains, right and the victims and start demanding more of the vendors i don't think we're going to get into a place where we're going to be able to drive down risk as much as we really want to i mean at the end of the day we have you know jeff and i were talking earlier like we should stop calling things vulnerabilities because it really diffuses responsibility we should start calling them product defects because that names it much more clearly right 
and that's what they are. And at the end of the day, it also highlights how important it is for tech manufacturers to design and develop and test and deploy software specifically focused on driving down dramatically the number of exploitable defects. And, and when you use the common language that's used in other industries, everybody else kind of gets it. Totally. Oh, a defect. Oh, we track defects. We study defects. We do these things. And it's, it goes away from being uh, mysterious so we can't protect ourselves. It's a vulnerability. Yeah, I mean, 100%. We should be learning from what other industries possess that like inexplicably oh, wait, did you sip out of your glass without clinking i did i was i was testing it oh okay i was testing it okay that, okay, was, a, that was an alpha test it's drinkable we're gonna it's go to drinkable. deployment okay we're deploying push to production okay here we go mm -hmm. Thank okay i'd buy that product sweet yeah um <laughs> i'm sorry I interrupted your flow there. I totally forgot what I was saying. So, oh, you know what I was saying? I was saying we were, we can learn a lot from what other industries possess that the world of software doesn't, right? I mean, the vast majority of other industries they do track defects and incidents that cause harm, so that you can specifically focus on reducing risk, the risk to driving on the highway, the risk to getting on an airplane. I mean, other industries are frankly obsessed with continuous improvement. It the thing that I find so mind-boggling about this as an outsider, not an engineer, is that think about all the safety engineering done around airplanes, space, water, any kind of large civil engineering infrastructure. They're held to these ridiculous standards. Everybody is certified, whatever. And then you take that and you're like, okay, that's what we do when it's like engineering versus nature. Yeah. We have all these – now it's engineering versus nature plus adversaries – so what we'll do is we're going to do less than we would have done if it was engineering versus nature. It doesn't make any sense. No, I'm with you, brother. Is anyone here from MITRE? We don't got MITRE people. I, I was talking about this yesterday. So MITRE in 2007 uh, published this white paper called Unforgivable Vulnerabilities. And it laid out criteria for cr classes of defect that would be considered unforgivable for being both easily found and easily exploited. So products that didn't, uh, didn't keep security, have security in mind at all. And, you know, folks in here can probably guess what was on the list, but it was memory safety violations and coding weaknesses leading to cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and directory traversal, right? So then 2023, 16 years later, M MITRE publishes another paper called Stubborn Weaknesses. And what do you think was at the top of the list? Yeah, memory safety violations and coding weaknesses leading to cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and directory traversal. They should have just named it version two of their original document. But yeah, I mean, they weren't as egregious as the ones in 2007, but many of them were. And so again, like this has to be a community thing. We all have to play a role, both from the supply side but as well as the demand side. I mean, all of us need to be demanding safer and more secure products and realizing that we have purchasing power. Right, so right. So I think there's, if you just- You're not gonna drink your drink, you don't like your drink. I'm drinking the drink, I'm hey, drinking the drink. No, I'm not forcing you. Wait, not. Look how much I've got, let's compare uh, drink size here. I drank that, no. So I think, you know, part of it is you have to recognize who's most responsible in any given situation. If it's a coding error, the people closest to the project probably bear the greatest responsibility in fixing it. Right? They're near the lever, the steering wheel, whatever, where they can make the change. Every step away from that, there's fewer and fewer things you can do. Like, oh, no, now I've got to wrap a firewall around it. Oh, now I have to wrap a monitoring system around it. But the closer you get to fixing the core problem, you maybe don't have to deploy all those other mitigations. Yeah. So... So my whole thing is the manufacturer or the person closest to the problem has the most responsibility. Comma, we should ask for better products. Comma, the government should regulate better labeling, better disclosures, better help inform the public debate. Comma, we should demand better of our partner nations. Com you know, there, there's a thing at each step and no one trumps the other, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a community thing. You know, one of the things that, we are having discussions around or it's a software liability regime 
And so one that has an articulable standard of care, but also safe harbor provisions for vendors that do innovate responsibly using secure development processes. So the, uh, the liability stuff, right? We've been complaining about that forever, but there's so many, right? There's so many ways you could do liability. You could say you're an open source software project. Your source is free. No liability for you because you can self protect. Yeah. Oh, you're a closed commercial product and you've end of life your product and it's, you don't ever plan to do anything with it. You still have liability, but if you open source it, no liability. You know, there's so many yeah. nuances and ways to approach it. And I feel like the liability discussion is always like all or nothing. And it but doesn't that's, have I'm to. It's like one of the levers to pull, yeah. right? I mean, if you, if you just think about, um, if two thirds of software vulnerabilities are memory safety, right? memory safety, then there is a lot that can be done across the ecosystem, quite frankly. But, you know, the, yes, the technology vendor plays a significant role, but also, you know, higher education. That's well, why we're having discussions system, with that, right? Right. Yeah, I think there's, and it's interesting because when I put on my government thinking hat, you look at a problem and you're like, okay, is this a problem that's uniquely a governmental question? A tragedy of the commons issue. There's no market force. The incentive models don't work to fix it. So in that case, traditionally, that's why we form governments, to help us in these areas where normal forces don't work. And then in other areas, you're like, oh, yeah, it totally responds to market forces. It responds to pricing or, or whatever. Yeah. Market forces aren't working in this. Yeah, market forces aren't course. working. And so yeah. it's funny because like when I started in professionally in this field in like 98, we were like, okay, we're going to run software vulnerability scanning tools and we're going to release scores against products. This will be like an 8.2 on the two, 1999 score system or whatever. And consumers will make informed decisions. You will all make informed decisions because you'll want to buy the thing with a higher score. <laughs> Oh, well, the software shrink wrap license prevents that. Yeah. Like, oh, why would you prevent people testing your software? That's my first inkling, like something is very wrong here. Yeah. But have you looked at the standard contract language for software? You bear the entire I, risk of right. this product. And it's I mean, like part of the issue. It's, so, it's, it's religion and software where there's no liability, right? Every other industry in the world has liability. Death and taxes. Yeah, or it's just crazy. Okay, so okay, so we're not going to get it with with this, um, the insurance industry. So right, so now we're into the early two thousands. The insurance industry will come along, and they will mandate rates and then better inform. And then companies want to save money. Then that didn't happen. And now here we are. Government's looking at their tool belt. They're like, what do we got? What do we got? Okay, uh, industry didn't work. Uh, Self-regulation didn't work. Uh, insurance didn't work. Oh, no. I only have regulation left. Like, we're running out of tools. And it's frustrating, but I know exactly how we got here. Yeah. Um, you know, it, this is not a surprise that we're now at the point of talking about liability. We saw this coming for decades. Yeah. I love to quote Dan Kaminsky yeah. on this. He said, like, you know, security was never a consideration when the uh, when the internet was invented. The internet was invented to move pictures of cats. <laughs> it's very good at that. Um, but I do think so. At the end of the day, we are a voluntary agency. But you know, we started out at RSA. We have this secure by de by design pledge where companies are signing up to it, committing to make material progress in seven key areas. You know, increasing use of MFA, decreasing use of default password, eliminating whole classes of vulnerabilities. And we had 68 vendors that signed it at RSA. Three months later, we're nearly at 200. And I think there's virtue in being able to track progress and transparently report on it. Right. Like, that's a way. It's not like we're going to give people scores and stuff, but we're, and we're going to have a third party do it. So I really think yeah, you need, I, I like that you have the cycle. Yeah, otherwise, they just stamp it and then they never... No, I mean, as you say, transparency creates trust. And part of that then will help consumers say, well, did you sign the pledge? How did you do on implementing the pledge? And, you know, that will help to build, I think, greater security and resilience into the yeah, ecosystem. I, I, I think product makers love to differentiate themselves. And so if you give them some ways to differentiate, maybe their marketing team takes it and runs with it. 
Yeah. And then then they maybe respond to, yeah. to you giving them more tools that they can use to differentiate themselves. No, I totally agree. Should we see if anyone has questions for us? Yeah, we're coming down to 20 minutes left. Let's um, see how this goes. And if you... 20 minutes of questions. And if you terrify us, we'll just drink. AJA. Ask Jeff. AJJA. Ask Jeff. Okay, Jeff. go ahead. So just maybe say where you're from or, or uh, anything to give us a little bit of perspective. Oh, wait, wait. Let's turn on the uh, microphone in the uh, Q&A session area. I, I try speaking at it again. We'll see if they've turned it up. Number four. Okay, there it is. Yeah, you got to be close to the microphone, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, you got to be closer than that. Okay. Yeah. Well, they say you basically have to eat the microphone for it to work, so. Yes. <laughs> My job is done here. Thanks, dude. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thank you for the kind words. Um, before I answer that, can I can I give you one of my pet peeves? Like the names that we call these threat actors drive me fricking bananas. I mean. You know, it gives, midnight it imbues blizzard, them with so much mystical power. fancy bear, wizard spider, nemesis kitten, the Lazarus group, Volt Typhoon. Yeah. That's redonkulous, man. I'm on this campaign, so I want to name, rename all these things Scrawny Nuisance. <laughs> right? I got more. I got more. Feeble Ferret. <laughs> Weak Weasel, and my favorite, Doofus Dingo. That's what I'm talking about, right? So it's a great question, and you know, frankly, um, this is something that we are super focused on at CISA, and it's a threat that's a different, that's different in kind. For most of my career, we really focused on China uh, as a threat of espionage, data theft, IP theft. And over the past couple years, we have seen Chinese cyberspace force actors embedding deep within our critical infrastructure, not for espionage, but rather to launch disruptive or destructive attacks in the event of a conflict in Taiwan. So it's a world where a war in Asia will have very real impacts on the lives of Americans, you would see pipelines exploding, pollution of water systems, severing of telecommunications, derailing of transportation nodes, all specifically to incite societal panic and chaos and deter our ability to marshal military might and citizen will. And so it is a very real threat. It's not a theoretical one because our hunt teams have actually worked with the private sector to identify and eradicate these actors from multiple sectors, water, power, comms, transportation. So really a real threat. And it's why we are making the case to how important resilience is for every single business. But to your point, they are using living off the land techniques. So it's not like malware, right? They're actually using the native processes of the system. 
And within the compromised infrastructure, they are hard to find. Uh, we have fantastic talents. It's a kudos to our threat hunt team. They've actually been able to find and identify them. Uh, but once they're in the infrastructure, they're hard to find. But the thing, the secure by design angle is the way that they're getting into the infrastructure is they're using uh, edge devices as a launch point. And those edge devices are actually very easy to compromise. And one of the uh, one of the vendors who we've been working with, actually credit to them because they were the first ones to sign the pledge, is Avanti. But that's an edge device, one of many that the Chinese are taking advantage of to hop into our critical infrastructure. And so what we did, we actually put out an emergency directive and told all of the federal civilian agencies, you need to pull out this piece of technology because we cannot guarantee that it does not um, implicate risk. And, you know, frankly, we work with that company. Um, and we realize that it has an issue on reputation and business, but they were really good to work with. They signed the pledge. They're making progress. We're going to track it. But that at the end of the day, that's the complexity. Um, yes, there are ways to find these actors if you know what to look for, but also the way that they're getting in, we've made it easy on them because we're not demanding enough from our technology vendors. And that's what our push for secure by design is. Okay, let's go to the next question. You got to get really close in there. Yeah, yeah. So, so your last question, absolutely. Um, we are working across the federal government to ensure that uh, we are eating our own dog food when it comes to secure by design or drinking our own bourbon, as it were, uh, when it comes to secure by design. And we work closely with, with GSA on FedRAMP. But we are absolutely using all of the tools of procurement. Just last week, we put out a uh, a secure by demand focused software acquisition guide for government enterprise customers. And, you know, then we put out something earlier this week, secure by demand for, for software customers. So questions that you can ask of vendors to see how they are prioritizing security. So, so yes is the answer to your uh, second question. Look, for the first one, like I'm the head goalie for cyber. Um, we're the cyber defenders, but we do work very closely with folks like Ambassador Nate Fick, who is the cyber ambassador. We work very closely with NSA, with Cybercom, and with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And I have to say, I think that we have, as a government, become more cohesive, more coherent, and we are using levers that have not necessarily been used as aggressively before to hold other governments accountable, whether it's through justice or whether it's in diplomatic ways. I get you that there is more to be done. There is always more to be done in this world. But I do think that um, across the federal government, we have attempted to um, more forcefully attribute uh, activity and hold partners accountable for uh, being involved in malicious cyber activity. So um, I've got a question on that. The um I always like to say internet problems are global pro problems. And so even, even when you have different opinions with China on a political issue, there's still a giant manufacturer. If there's a problem in a product or a, a defect of something or other, you still have to talk with China because their chances are they're manufacturing the thing, right? Yeah. So you still need to maintain positive relationships, working relationships with the manufacturers around the entire world. And sometimes those manufacturers are in countries who are having a political disagreement, but you still have to have positive relationships because they're producing the thing, Yeah. right? So you have to have a sort of a nuance. And I think maybe CISA is in a unique position and that, like you mentioned earlier, you're not 
intelligence community, you're not military, right? You're civilian, so you can speak from a different perspective yeah. that's more civilian than military. Yeah. And, you know, that, that opportunity has not come up. Um, I think we talked about this as one of the early meetings, like having the head of CISA and the head of, the, of China CERT together. Um, frankly, given some of the things that we have seen them doing in our critical infrastructure, um, which I don't think that they've owned up to. In fact, they've denied. completely denied it. I think that's really problematic because at the end of the day, um, these targets are civilian critical infrastructure. And uh, I, I would be happy to have discussions that were in good faith where we thought we could make real progress, but I'm not sure we're at that stage right now. Okay, let's go to the next gentleman. Take take what off the table? Okay. We take why are we so if you magically table? have secured by design and it achieves all of its goals and it's done, what's next in line? But are you? Oh, what's the next? I don't know if I heard that. What is that? Yeah, so, so it's basically if you have secure by design success and Rust and everybody in the world's using Rust, what's next? Yeah. So, so, you know, I sort of said tongue in cheek yesterday. We want to get to a world where the community works to make products so secure that cybersecurity goes away. I mean, the reason we have the cybersecurity industry is because technology vendors have been able to create flawed, defective, defective. insecure products. Defective. or defective yes. for decades, right? Because it's been all about incentives have been speed to market uh, and features, not security. So if, I, if, we, if we actually achieve secure by design, I mean, I will be like doing the Snoopy dance everywhere, right? Because that will be a world where ransomware is a shocking anomaly and where damaging software vulnerabilities are as infrequent as plane crashes. Now, does that mean um, does that mean that vulnerabilities or defects will go away completely? No, of course not. I, I fundamentally believe you can dramatically drive down the number of exploitable defects, but there will still be uh, room for the uh, research community, the hacking community. I mean, this community is actually responsible for making us all better, right? We run the Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure Program for the US government, so we work with researchers all the time and we have an enormous respect and admiration for folks and we intermediate between hackers and product owners and i don't think that will go away completely but we do want to live in a world where the number of defects in our products is dramatically lowered i mean that that will be a better world for all of us where we don't have to worry about our parents constantly you know, having to deal with malware and all of this. So there will always be a role for hackers. Um, yeah, and you know, even if every bit of code in the universe is memory safe, temporally, spatially memory safe, there's always going to be business logic flaws. There's, you know, there's so many other categories, but that's what you want to do, right? You want to push them up the stack. You want the difficulty to become harder. You don't want a mass exploit. We want you to have to spend all the time in the world understanding one business system to exploit some business logic flaw and one thing yeah. instead of a single yeah. one-off that can exactly. devastate an entire landscape. Create massive friction yeah. for attackers, for squatting yeah, nations. And you want to make it be more noisy so when they do do something, it's more visible. Yeah. And so, okay.
Thanks, dude. <laughs> well, thank you. Wonder Twin Powers, activate. That, that AI will unleash, you mean, or? Yeah. Threat of AI. Threat of AI. Yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing is, um, it's really, we might have to drink to the end of CAPTCHA, <laughs> right? I mean, if AI is that good, right? I mean, so for example, we run this, we're, you caught on to the fact we're really big into community. And so DEF CON, a couple of years ago, we started the Mastodon server, DEF CON.social. And um, before Elon bought Twitter, we were kind of hedging our bets. So we started to build our Mastodon server just in case things go south, things went south on Mastodon. And, um, and so people are signing up to the service. And now you put in a CAPTCHA. And so we use HCAPTCHA, it's the more friendly CAPTCHA, more privacy respecting CAPTCHA. Well, then you start paying attention, like, does this CAPTCHA actually prevent spam signups? And it's supposedly a, a very performant CAPTCHA. And you start reading academic studies, HCAPTCHA can be bypassed 98% of the time. But the competitors are 99% of the time. Do you know? Do you know who created CAPTCHA? We're fifty percent more effective. Do you know where CAPTCHA was created? Where? Do you know who created it? Who? It was at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon, yeah. Yeah, that's why we did our like. Well, not why, but one of the cool reasons we did our like secure by design launch. Was, was it cool. Carnegie Mellon? Yeah. So then you're like, okay, well, that's the defeat rate. What's the human rate? Humans can buy, you know, pass CAPTCHA seventy eight percent of the time. So it's like, well, if you don't make a mistake, you're probably a robot. So you have to make some mistakes. And so, like, that's done. I don't see CAPTCHAs, right? And it's sad because, oh, no, we're defenseless. But that we better own up to it really quick because pretending that we're not defenseless, that's not going to work, right? And so it feels like AI is going to fundamentally change some of this stuff. Like, one of the questions is, okay, well, almost perfect voice duplication for these CEO takeover voice tax. Yeah. Okay, well, that's reality. We can't pretend we're going back. So no more voice authentication. Okay. But we better own up to that really quick, right? Well, yeah, I mean, say a couple of things. Like, I, I am a tech optimist. I'm an optimist in general, and I'm a tech optimist. I wouldn't be in this business if I weren't. We just named a chief AI officer, Lisa Einstein, who kicks some serious ass. I'm really proud of her. Um, Lisa Einstein, please stand up, here. chief she's AI officer, here, yeah. Sissa. Rock on, rock on. Yay. <laughs> um, because we want to ensure that we are leveraging these capabilities for cyber defense, but we also want to make sure that we are reducing risk from these capabilities to critical infrastructure. So. We put out a roadmap with a lot of the work that we're doing. We put out um, a guide uh, specific on Secure by Design for AI with international partners, federal partners. So the same as we've been talking about software, like AI, the same rules apply to AI. You have to consider security first because you know these are very powerful, fast moving capabilities, but we, we don't want to be scared of them. We want to be able to optimize the use of them. And so we're excited about the power of it. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of hype here, so we don't want to get sucked into the hype. But you know, we were at the um, AICC. I think you guys just heard from those folks yesterday. And so, if there are things that can be done with some of these capabilities to find and fix vulnerabilities, the thing that I am very excited about is the ability to use AI to refactor code from memory unsafe to memory safe. Like think about how that could have a transformative impact on some of the defects that we have to deal with on a daily basis. So 
I think we should get excited about it, but I don't think we should get like Sky, Skynet scared about it. The the only thing I'd I'd say is, you know, I spent a lot of my life uh, doing counterterrorism. I was in Iraq twice, Afghanistan, and like you know, we used to talk about Al Qaeda's chief bomb maker a lot. And now you think about like Al Qaeda's chief AI officer, like that ain't good, oh, right? The, the that, pictures of the data centers in the tunnels in yeah, uh, like yeah. that. That's just ungood. And so we want to make sure that these capabilities are protected from being used by terrorists and criminals and rogue nations to do real harm. Okay, we only have one time time for one question. I'm sorry. So you've got it. Hopefully it's, go for it. Better be be the greatest question ever. No No pressure. pressure. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Closer to the microphone. Closer. Closer to the microphone. Right. Okay, so the question is around cyber li- liability. Do you think it's going to be hard to do because of all the laws around liability? Yes, he- I do. Because what? Because it's what? Oh, oh. Oh, yeah. No, it's an interesting issue when you think about it. Um, because a lot of the incidents that happen, it is ve- we very much focus on the proximate cause, not the root cause. So you're exactly right. I mean, that's the, the issues around human error. Like we had a ransomware attack because somebody downloaded a malicious file or got fished into giving up their password, right? So we always focus on the proximate cause, not the not the root cause and yeah to get anything done like this is hard and i always worry that you know it's going to be a major devastating attack that actually gets some sort of legislation i mean i i think uh, i would just give you my perspective from working closely with members of commerce uh, congress they get this they understand i do think the report that we released uh the cyber safety review board report caught a lot of attention in terms of how important a culture of security is, how important it is for a vendor to take accountability and responsibility for producing secure software. So I don't think it's impossible, but it will take a lot of work to do. I do think that is something, you know, this is, as Jeff was saying, there's all kinds of levers that can lead us to a more secure ecosystem. I do think that is a very important one because it leads to a product differentiator. Thank you for the question. All right, everyone, let's give it up. Thank you for being here. Thanks, everybody. Love you.